Welcome back, my friends. Currently, we're on day 235 of Russia's disastrous invasion of Ukraine. And here's the current situation reports. The noose continues to tighten around the Russian-occupied region in Kherson. Ukrainian troops remained focused on cutting off the Russians' only way out of Kherson as part of their southern offensive. So the government in Kyiv has asked for a media blackout. They don't want people posting pictures and videos and troop positions or movements. So the military maps over the next couple days might not be updated. Here's the most uh, recent map from the Institute for the Study of War, this region on the north bank of the river. More than likely, it's not going to update over the next couple days as Ukraine is launching some pretty large uh, offensive operations. Same is true for the military map on deepstatemap.live. This might not update for the next couple days as Ukraine is pushing pretty hard to retake the north bank of the river. And we know things are going poorly for the Russians as there's been all these media reports of the civilian leadership, the Russian-appointed governor and mayor in the city of Kherson. They've fled the city. They've relocated to Henechesk, and they've been asking for the Russian milita military to evacuate all their collaborators. We'll see what happens over the coming days and the coming weeks. This position right here is the most vulnerable for the Russian military as it's very difficult to resupply. The other big news story that broke over the last day was a gunman or several gunmen opened fire on volunteer soldiers at a Russian military training ground in Belgorod, killing 11 and wounding 15 others. You know this is a pretty big news story when it's not just on social media and major news outlets like Al Jazeera pick it up. We don't have all of the details, and I doubt the Russian Ministry of Defense is going to confirm anything, but allegedly the rumor is, is that three men from a former Soviet Republic uh, came to Russia to fight, and these men were Muslim, and they got into a religious argument with uh, conscripts or, or mobilized Russian men, Everyone is handed weapons, and uh, they decided to resolve their disputes by opening fire uh, on their compatriots. I don't, I don't even know what to call them. But the point I want to illustrate here is that Russia is exposing a vulnerability because the Russian Empire is a very diverse place, and there's massive political and economic equality amongst these diverse people. However, at this moment, they're all being mobilized, they're all being tossed together, and they're all being given weapons. So this spells a recipe for disaster where incidents such as this might continue to occur in the future. Here's a video that I will link down below. It showed up on Twitter. I can't play it for you because what happens in this video is that a ethnic Russian, a, a Russian man probably from... Uh, a well-to-do city, said something offensive about eth ethnic Kazakhs. So Kazakhstan, yes, is a country, but along the border region, there are ethnic Kazakhs who are also Russian citizens. They've been mobilized. This Russian man said something uh, derogatory and offensive about Kazakh people. So these Kazakh soldiers who have been mobilized took him out to this field and punched his face in uh, on camera, making him apologize and say they would never say anything offensive about Kazakh people ever again. I'll link the video down below. It's, it's pretty disturbing. And I just think that these racial tensions are going to continue escalating as everyone in the Russian military is being stressed to the max, and they all know something, something is going terribly wrong for them. Here's an unbelievable intercepted phone call uh, from a Russian soldier, either calling his wife or his girlfriend. And this is straight from a Russian soldier. He describes how their front lines are organized in order to fight the Ukrainians. So let's watch about one minute of this clip together. 
представляешь? Мы, мы на обучении. Ну, блин, мы знаем. Мы уже во все инстанции писали. Всем вообще все равно. Труповой тоже не дождались. Их вряд ли пришлют в ближайшее время. Чего они пришлют? Мертвых, мертвых. А их полно, и лебедянских, и липецких. Обалдеть. Игорек звонил, говорил, там у вас кушать нечего. Нечего, согласен. Вообще нет еды. У кого денег нет, тот, блядь, пшеницу с поля жрет проросшую. И у нас жеков привезли с тюрьмы. Ну. И куда-то завели вперед, вперед. А мы сидим, как за град отряд, блядь. Если кто назад побежит, замочь. Какой-то кошмар. А у нас так э, поставлено. То есть мы сидим вторые, охраняем первых. Сзади нас еще линия, туда тоже не вернешься. То есть убежать нереально свои пристрелы. So there's a lot in this phone call. Number one, there is a food shortage. Uh, the soldiers are on the front lines are not getting enough to eat. Two, there's corpses and bodies everywhere. Bodies are not being shipped back home to Russia, returned to their loved ones. But he describes what are their three lines of military defense. And the first line of defense is criminals and the undesirables. Anyone the commander doesn't like and probably wants to get rid of, they're sent to the first line of defense uh, in, in fortified Russian positions. The second line of defense are recently mobilized men. They're not equipped very well, they have no training, but at least they can shoot the criminals and the undesirables should they try and retreat any farther back. You then have the third line of defense, which is the regular Russian military, once again, poorly trained, but ideally they have enough training to shoot the recently mobilized men should they try and retreat. This is how Russia fights wars. This is how Russia has been fighting wars for hundreds of years. And we're now finding out in the year 2022 that things have not gotten any better for them. This is their strategy. This is their plan. This is how they're hoping to defeat Ukraine. So obviously we're getting reports uh, in Russia of men who were recently mobilized. This story is about four men who were mobilized on September 26th, and they all were killed uh, on the front lines in Ukraine by October 7th. So these reports of their loved ones uh, being killed on the front lines, there's grief and outrage amongst the civilian population back in Russia. And relatives are asking, why were they sent to the front lines so fast? Often the government in Russia is telling them nothing at all, just a date and place in which they were killed, but more than likely they're not even, they're not even getting bodies returned. So here is a group of Russian women, mothers and wives. For the first 45 seconds of this clip, they're just introducing themselves and saying who their loved one is who's currently serving. But this is their direct appeal to Vladimir Putin to do something about recently mobilized Russian men being immediately sent to the front lines in Ukraine. Мы просим вас нам помочь, с криком души, разобраться нам во всей этой несправедливой ситуации, что наши преда предают на передавание, не подготовленные. Без военной подготовки данные ребята были отправлены сейчас на передавание. С ними связи сейчас нет. Перед тем, как их отправить на передавание, их им угрожали. Старшину у них отбирают все, все обмонтирование, все отбирают на передовую ребят. The audio on this video is very soft because these women are terrified. Uh, they're speaking at very soft tones, but they are speaking directly to Vladimir Putin, confused why he's doing this. Why is he sending their husbands and sons immediately to the front lines to be used as cannon fodder? My apologies to these women. 
They should have been smart enough to get their husbands and sons out of the country like hundreds of other Russian men have done in the last couple of weeks. So the hunt is on for more bodies, uh, more conscripts. They need to keep feeding the meat grinder in, in Ukraine. So here are draft commissars uh, hunting down their man. Let's see if he can get away or not. Nope, too many of them. Uh, they caught him. Uh, this is a future brave soldier of Russia. He's in the army now. He'll probably be on the front lines in Ukraine within the next week or two. So now that we're three or four weeks into this partial military mobilization, public opinion in Russia is finally starting to change. Here's an interesting survey that was conducted in Russia by the Levada Center. And this is the change in opinion of Russian people prior to mobilization and after mobilization. And these numbers are very revealing. So the first one is, are you really concerned about the events in Ukraine? And prior to mobilization, only 37% of Russian respondents were concerned about what was happening in Ukraine. And that number has now jumped to 56%. The next one, are you following what is happening in Ukraine? Prior to mobilization, only 51%. That's pretty revealing that about 49% of the Russian population for eight months was ignoring the conflict in Ukraine. They didn't know about it. They didn't want to know about it. That's kind of the mindset of people in Russia to remain apolitical. They just stopped paying attention because it's uncomfortable for them. But this number has now jumped to 66%. The next one, do you support the actions of the Russian armed forces in Ukraine? It's declined from 76 to 72. 72% is still pretty high, but in general, you can interpret this as, do you support the troops? Do you support the soldiers who are fighting and dying for your country, even if you disagree with why they were sent there? So life in Russia is changing. Uh, people are politically starting to wake up. And here's a clip I want to share with you of weddings in St. Petersburg being fast-tracked to accommodate recently mobilized men. So these are all men reporting for mobilization, and they want to tie the knot with their girlfriends before being shipped off to Ukraine. Uh, normally, there's a one-month waiting period from when you apply for a marriage license between when you can actually get married, but St. Petersburg is granting exceptions to men who are mobilized. And let's just watch about a minute of this clip together. По закону брак регистрируют не раньше, чем через месяц после подачи заявления. В исключительных случаях закон позволяет гражданам расписываться за один день. Для этого должны быть особые обстоятельства. Совсем недавно в перечень уважительных причин для ускоренной регистрации добавилось наличие мобилизационного предписания. Сегодня мы присутствуем на уникальном массовом процессе бракосочетания. И это главное отличие. Но вопросы к парам у ведущей церемонии остаются все те же. На своем добровольном согласии молодые сообщали с места. Причина, по которым петербуржцы хотят как можно скорее связать себя узами брака со своей второй половинкой перед отправлением на фронт, весьма понятна. Прежде всего, это хорошая моральная дополнительная поддержка. Что дома ждет супруга, родной человек. The future widows of Russia, I hope they get a nice death benefit when their husband is killed in Ukraine. So here is an interesting story from Chris O on Twitter. According to the Russian Baza Telegram channel, the stripper industry in Russia has been greatly impacted by this war. Now I know this is why you guys tune into my YouTube channel. You want the hard-hitting facts about what is going on with this war in Ukraine. But apparently when hundreds of thousands of young Russian men are either mobilized or flee the country, this has a negative impact on the domestic stripper industry. In addition, lots of women, because their husbands have been mobilized or fled, they're also hurting for cash, so they're turning to prostitution, prostitution and stripping in order to make ends meet in Russia. 
As always, I link everything down below if you'd like to learn more about this story. I just felt like mentioning it to you. But in general, around the world, there is this process occurring of de russification Russia's standing in the world, their prestige, their soft power, and even their economic power has been completely decimated by this war in Ukraine. It's going to take Russia decades to repair their public perception as well as their economy. Here's an article from the Moscow Times. And yes, this is a bookshop in Kyiv. The owner is dumping her collection of Russian literature because who wants to buy it? Uh, that's pretty much a stand-in for Russian culture around the world. It's not, it's not going to get any better as this war continues to deteriorate for Russia. The next clip comes from Julia Davis with Russian Media Monitor. I want to share with you about one and a half minutes of this clip of a commentator on Russian state TV calling for the Russian government to supply weapons, or WMD, to terrorist organizations in order to carry out attacks on U.S. military personnel. This man wants Russia to arm terrorists to attack U.S. military bases. Соответственно, нам нужно сейчас создать опасность для Соединенных Штатов, именно Соединенных Штатов, не Европы. Как? Как она должна выглядеть? Пока Соединенные Штаты не окажутся в положении, в котором мы сейчас, когда мы вынуждены вести боевые действия, когда мы вынуждены тратить ресурсы и когда гибнут наши люди, вот в таком же положении должны сейчас оказаться Соединенные Штаты. Один из способов – это накачивать вооружение всех врагов Соединенных Штатов, чтобы начали взрываться американские военные базы за рубежом. Не мы по ним ударили. И когда кто... So, to any of my American viewers, I want to speak directly to you at this moment because there are commentators and media personalities in America who are pro-Russia and pro-Putin and they regurgitate Kremlin talking points on their programs. Personalities such as Tucker Carlson... Kremlin State TV then uses clips of Tucker Carlson on their news programs to tell their people that America secretly supports Russia. I just want to remind all the Americans out there, maybe some who watch Tucker Carlson, that on Russian State TV they are calling for terrorists to be armed by Russia to blow up U.S. military bases. So... That's something I feel like advertisers who sponsor Tucker Carlson should really uh, know about. It's going to get me going, guys. I get triggered when this kind of stuff comes up. Next story I have for you involves uh, the Chinese government. Uh, they've finally called for their citizens to evacuate Ukraine. And this is kind of telling in that this special limited military operation by Russia was only supposed to last three to seven days, 10 days tops. So the Chinese government didn't want to embarrass the Russian government by ordering their citizens to evacuate the country. But this has been an active war zone for eight months and Russia is losing, so China finally put out the call that their citizens should probably leave Ukraine at this time. Just kind of an interesting tell from China. Good news for Ukraine, 20 more Ukrainian defenders were released in a recent prisoner of war swap. 
Uh, it's always a feel-good story when defenders are returned. Who were they exchanged for? It doesn't really matter. Final clip I want to share with you is the story of an Indian restaurant in Kyiv. This is an Indian man, I believe, who is married to a Ukrainian woman, and they've had a family in Ukraine. And when the war broke out, he decided to start feeding anyone who was looking for a hot meal for free. And he's been supplying free food for people for almost eight months now. This story uh, aired originally on CNBC. The war has brought hunger, and hunger has brought cues for food. This one at an Indian restaurant in Kiev. Restaurant owner Kuldeep Kumar is determined to do his bit to offer all the support he can to the hungry. My family is here. They are all Ukrainian in that tough time in Ukraine. So we are helping the people. That's why we are doing. About 700 to 1,000 people are coming every day. And we started 20th of February. We started for the students, Indian students. And now we, we are doing for Ukrainian people. Those have a problem. That's why. Actually, we made a good money over there in Ukraine, so we are now spending for the people. It's a good hot Indian meal at the new Bombay Palace restaurant that volunteers serve to whoever comes along to take away or to sit and have at the restaurant itself. Offering free food is always an act of kindness. When it is langar, it is a religious obligation. It's free. A feel-good story that restores my faith in humanity. There are decent people everywhere in the world, and people will step up to help one another uh, if they have the means. This is what I believe. That's all for this update video. If you found it informative, give me a thumbs up. I greatly appreciate it. Comments or questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care, be safe.